culture, a holiday, a special day. Uh, <coughs> Mother's Day today. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> uh, the Buddha said <coughs> about parents. He said, even if you were to carry your mother around on one shoulder and your father around on the other shoulder for the rest of their lives, every day feeding them food, the best food and every night massaging them to sleep, nonetheless you would not pay back their kindness. <clears throat> the kindness that is the gift of this body. If we are grateful to our parents, then we're grateful through the use of this body, the thoughts that we have with this body, which they gave us. Thank you for that. And if we're not grateful, maybe we're angry sometimes. Uh, We're angry, nonetheless, with this body. We're using this very body, including the nervous system, to be angry. And so even then, we are using the tool that they gave us. We're just choosing to use that tool to harbor anger. It's okay, we can do that, but we're still using the same tool. And... <clears throat> This is the way that the Buddha described it. He said the reason that we must be so grateful is that this tool is our only tool. This is it. This is the only tool we have for progressing on the path to awakening. We don't have any other tool. We need to use this tool. And if you want, you can think of this one tool as two tools, body and mind, if you wish. But that's just one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is it's just one, <clears throat> and therefore it's just one tool. And we receive this from our parents. You receive it, of course, in the genetic material and the proteins and such that uh, synthesize through the reactions of that material and the physical body, but also we're given care. We're given the care of food, water, a safe place to live, and the uh, psychological support so that we can grow into a mature person. Uh, as many of you may know, the Buddha's mother, Queen Maya, Mahamaya, passed away a week after he was born. So he didn't know her in this life. Mm -hmm. So he didn't have a way in, in his uh, human life. So he didn't have a way to pay back her kindness. And if you know how he did repay his kindness to her? Some of you might know. How did he do it? Didn't he go up to teach the heaven and teach her how to do the practice? Uh, yeah, I don't know if he taught her how, how to practice, but he did teach her the Abhidhamma. So a third of the Buddhist scriptures are dedicated to her, uh, which is very significant. He went up to heaven where she was residing and taught her the deepest, the highest aspects of the Dharma. Uh, he had another mother. who became the queen, whose name was Maha Pajapati Gotami. And she took very good care of him. As a child, she loved him very much and supported him in many ways. She was a wonderful mother, and he was very grateful to her. And then one day, he 
realized that suffering was a terrible problem and death was coming and he didn't know when. And so he, this various, there are many stories about this, the different traditions and different periods tell this story in different ways, but one way that this story is told is that he went to his parents, King Suddhodana and Queen Pachapachi Gotami, and uh, told them that he would, wanted to leave home and study the way. He'd leave them. He wouldn't become the king. He wouldn't spend more, any more time in the palace. He'd go and become a monk. And they vehemently disagreed with this decision. It made them cry, made them miserable. And they said, life is so short, why don't you stay with us for as long as you can? And he said, because life is so short and we don't know how short it will be. We don't know when we'll die. He said, if you can guarantee me that if I stay with you until you pass away, that at that time I'll still be healthy, then I'll stay. Can you guarantee me that? And of course they couldn't. They couldn't give him that guarantee. Especially since he was a king. And as a, you know the main job of a king at that time? Was to kill people, of course. And when, you, when, you want, when it's your job to kill people, those people tend to consider it to be their job to kill you. So it's a very dangerous profession to be a king. Kings have traditionally died uh, quite a bit. Uh, they, uh, they, die, they die young often. Uh, I believe the pharaohs of pharaohs in Egypt, I think their average reign was six years. <laughs> That's, about, that's, that's your average lifespan if you become a king, at least at that time. So he, <clears throat> um, to kill people means that he needed to, to wage war and to defend the kingdom. And so he said, it's just too dangerous. What if I don't attain liberation before I die? So he needed to leave home. And in so doing, he, he left home, but with the promise that after his awakening, he would return. Because he knew that the only way that he could repay the kindness of his parents was to teach them, was to give them the opportunity to become free from suffering themselves. So he did leave home, he did attain awakening, and he did return to Kaplavastu and to the palace where he taught both of them. And uh, his father at that time attained full awakening. And uh, he was sick and wasn't able to live a life of awakening because soon after his awakening he passed away. His mother at the time, Pachapachi Gotami, was deeply touched by his teaching. And she founded the Order of Nuns. She followed him and uh, left home herself and created the Order of Nuns, which was the first women's organization in the history of the world, at least that we know of. First official organization founded by women, uh, for women, of women, which flourished uh, for centuries. And she is known as Maha, the great, the great Gotami. She was a magnificent leader and uh, a great deal of uh, the teachings that we now have were influenced by, or in fact taught by, her. But it's interesting in the Buddhist tradition, uh, at least of later times, in the tantric schools especially, there's a... Ma, Queen Maya was Gautama Buddha's mother, and Pajapati Gautami was his de facto mother. But there's an even greater, quote, mother who is credited with 
being the mother of all the Buddhas. And her name is Prajna Paramita, which means perfection of wisdom. So her name is actually perfection of wisdom. It's, a, it's quite a name. <laughs> uh, and the reason for that is that in, in Buddhism in particular, but in, uh, in Indic and Tibetan civilization, uh, there are considered to be two significant qualities that make up the spiritual path. One is wisdom and the other is compassion. And whenever you have a duality like this, we live in a, in a species that, that has a, a very basic duality, male and female. It's very difficult to not associate one duality with the other, and so we tend to, and so in that, and so we end up associating wisdom with male or female and compassion with male or female. And in that particular tradition, wisdom is considered to be a primarily female characteristic, while compassion is considered to be a primarily male characteristic. And so the basic wisdom is considered to be the, the basic quality of the, of of women, of females. And therefore, it makes a lot of sense that a Buddha, a perfectly wise being, would be born from a, being born from a being, that being the perfection of wisdom, that that being would be represented by a female. And that female is also closely associated with the, with the being Tata, because some of you may have heard of. She's... Uh, of extraordinary significance in Tibetan Buddhism. And so there's an enormous gratitude given to mothers. And one of the ways that this is represented is that a basic teaching, a basic, uh, a basic way of describing our relationship with others is to say that so as as Danny said recently in order to make use of this teaching you to a certain extent have to believe at least momentarily in rebirth you have to at least be willing to give it a give it a try so just give it a try come along for a little while and give a try to, to the concept of rebirth. So the idea is that there's beginningless time, and since beginningless time, we've been going through the round of rebirth. That means you're born, you live, you die. You're born, you live, you die. You're born, you live, you die. And uh, your spiritual progress is maintained through that cycle. And as you go through that cycle, you have different relationships with different people. And... The teaching is this, uh, it's beginningless time. Beginningless time is, is long. It's a long time. And it's so much time that that was enough time that through the course of natural evolution, everyone in the world at some point was each person's mother. Everyone, every single person, it has been every other person's mother at some point. So if you look around the room, you're looking around at all of your various mothers. Each of us was, was our mother at some point. If, you might have to go back quite a ways, but if, you, if we get into beginningless time, that's no problem. You can go back as far as you need to, and then you'll find that someone, uh, whoever it is, was your mother at some point. And so, of course, we have to have enormous gratitude to every person, every single person, because they were our mother. To have enormous gratitude. So we can uh, expand on the teaching that we should be enormously grateful to our parents by saying that we should be enormously grateful to everyone. <clears throat> Nonetheless, in this particular birth, we, uh, we have a certain connection with a certain set of parents. And it's important to 
honor that in particular in this life. So, thank you for your support. Uh, my mother has uh, taken very good care of me. Uh, it was to my mother that I gave my first, uh, if I might be so bold as to call it, a roar. I roared out in a way that would certainly change my life, the importance of being uh, compassionate to all living things. I don't know if you remember this, but I remember very clearly we were in the kitchen, you were making dinner. Oh, you remember this? Oh, neat. Wow, great. Uh, we were in the kitchen, and, and, and uh, so tell me if I'm correct. You were listening to NPR. Is this true? You're, she was always listening to NPR. Uh, whenever it was daily event, NPR would come on, and I would dance to the unfortunately short periods of music. <laughs> and then NPR would go on about something irrelevant. And then, uh, and then the music would come again, right? And the music would, it, it was, it seemed to be on just enough to keep you listening. <laughs> that seemed to be the reason for the music. And then they talked for a while. And then the music would come on again. I could dance again. And so, with my pillow, right? I had a pillow that I'd dance with and fight with. But, but at that point, mostly dance with. And we, uh, we listened to something about... Uh, I suppose something environmental, some sort of destruction of life. And this is something that I've been thinking about quite a bit. Why? Why had I been thinking about this quite a bit? Well, because of my parents. Because my parents uh, are two very caring people who don't just talk about it, but who live it. Uh, both of them have given their entire lives to service. It's actually true. Who? That's an amazing thing to be able to say. And it's true. Both of them have given their lives to service. My father to service of the environment, my mother primarily to service of human beings, um, although both of them uh, have done both. And um, have chosen to be of service to the earth and to human beings in a way that made it impossible for me to avoid that. It wasn't a choice given to me. And my mother likes to talk about how, as a mother, you can't do anything really for your children except give them choices. You give them opportunities, and then they may or may not take advantage of those opportunities. You try to prepare them for whatever will be of benefit to them. They may or may not take advantage of that, but in any case, you can give them opportunities. So that's true. Thank you for that philosophy. But from a certain perspective, I didn't have a choice. I was in a home in which I needed to face the importance of being of service, whether I liked it or not. Wouldn't you say that's the case? <laughs> I didn't have a choice. Uh, it's important to take care of others. And when you take care of others, sometimes you suffer. And that's just the way it is. And you four-year-old need to accept that, because that's the reality. And I feel very grateful for that because uh, I know myself, and I know that I would avoid that if I could. So thank you for not allowing me to avoid that reality, that it is important to take care of others, and sometimes that makes us suffer, and that's just the way it is. <laughs> if I had the choice to think, well, I don't want it to be that way, then I certainly would have taken advantage of that opportunity to avoid that. But thank you for not giving me that opportunity. I was in a place in which our lives uh, were constricted by the resources that one can get when one is working for environmental nonprofits and when one is taking care of human beings who. Uh, need help. Uh, 
and that must be done. Uh, this is the this is the the great lesson that is hardwired into me. I think I don't think that I uh, can get away from this reality. We must take care of others, and sometimes that makes us suffer, and that's just how it is. We still must take care of others. And that is how we make, that is, that is a basic way that we make personal progress. Uh, as my mother said, meditation is one way to purify our minds. But there's, an, there's another way to purify our minds. And that is that we have the responsibility to care for others. And so we do what we believe is right for someone. And because we've done that for them, because we've benefited them in that way, they hate us. And so, now this happens, doesn't it? This can happen. We can do the right thing for someone, something that helps them, and for that reason they hate us. And so we leave the situation, we return and we consider, and we conclude this is the right thing to do. And then we continue to do it. This is also a form of purification. So thank you for teaching me that. And thank you not only for teaching it, but thank you for living it day after day. So that's what I had learned, that there are certain things that must be done. We must care for others. She had been very clear with me that what, she, she said a million times, I want you to be happy. She told me that all the time, I want you to be happy. And I was very fortunate to have that lesson, I want you to be happy, given to me, and we must take care of others, even if that makes us suffer. And I want you to be happy, and we must take care of others. And I want you to be happy. Because this can be very confusing to us. Why would doing something that makes us suffer be in harmony with the pursuit of happiness? It seems impossible from a certain perspective, and I think that, again, if I had the ability, I would have avoided the horrifying confusion that comes from trying to understand how these two things can possibly be in harmony. And yet they are in harmony. We do the right thing, even if that makes us suffer. Why? Because we want to be happy. Because we want each other to be happy. That's what my mother said. She said, I want you to be happy. I want you to be happy. And she showed me, and also talked, but actually, you didn't talk about it very much. Mostly just showed me the importance of taking care of others. I actually don't think you talked about that very much at all. But you certainly showed it to me, and you know how it is, you know what we actually learn. <laughs> we don't learn much from what people say, but we learn from watching and observing. And that's what I did. And so, I learned. My mother wants me to be happy, and I must take care of others, even if that makes me suffer. And this was the reality that I lived in. And so, as we listened to NPR and we heard a little bit about the destruction that human beings are producing, I had a certain thought. And it's a thought that many of us have had. Many of us at that age have had this thought. But we don't necessarily say it. But I said it out loud to my mother for another, due to another teaching that she has given me. And that is that something that you've said so often is that she believes in me. You can do it, she says. She says it constantly. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's the default. If my mother isn't saying something else, then that's what she's saying. 
<laughs> she'll only say something else if there's some special reason. Otherwise, she'll just say that. You can do it. I believe in you. So I was talking to someone who had taught me that she wanted me to be happy, that the way to be happy is to care for others, even if that makes us suffer, and that whatever it is that must be done to be of service, whatever it is that I see must be done, I can do it. This is a perfect storm, isn't it? It's a magnificent uh, way of bringing up a four-year-old boy. And because of all of that support and care and example, I was capable of saying the following words. Mom, we need to do something. Is that what I said? We need to do something about this problem. People are destroying the world, and we have to do something about it. And, I meant it. I was able to mean it, because of that support, because of that care. I was able to actually mean it. And I was able to throw away the various lives that I could have lived that were not in accordance with that statement in order to live a life that is somewhat in accordance with that statement. I'm doing my best, I have a long way to go, but to some extent I live a life that I'm proud of. Live a life that is based on the clarity of that statement that I said as my mother made dinner for me. So, my parents have done a lot of very good work. Work that has impressed me, work that has inspired me work that has educated me in what's possible in a human life. And they have thrown themselves into it and they have done a certain amount of that work, a certain amount of good work to make the world a better place. And I don't have the unrealistic expectation that they will have done all of the work they will have done every bit of work that needed to be done inside of themselves or outside of themselves. I'm aware that I inherit the work that they haven't done. The work that I've inherited from your personalities, which I carry inside of me, and your legacy, which I see outside of me. And I see it as an honor. I take it as an honor that I could join in this lineage of people who have tried our best to make a positive impact on the world, who have given our lives to taking care of others, even if that makes us suffer, because that's how we attain true happiness, with an absolute conviction that what must be done can be done. I feel honored to take up this task, the great task of caring for the world and myself, uh, that you have carried, that you've taught me how to carry, and that we all carry together, all of us being mothers to each other, all of us receiving motherly kindness from each other. This is an inconceivable honor for me.
So thank you for your life. And thank you for my life.